could go ahead and get started. It's 6.03. So I want to welcome everyone for coming to our alumni panel this evening. Um, and this year we're doing something different from what we've done in previous years. We've been doing this alumni panel for several years now as part of our homecoming week activities. And um, in the past, the Dean has hosted it and asked the questions in the first part. And then we open it up to the audience to ask additional questions um, toward the end of the webinar. But this event is really for students and about engaging students with our alumni who used to be students. And so um, I thought it would be really nice to invite our student leaders from our different student organizations to actually ask the questions of the panel and interact with them right from the very beginning. So my job is just to introduce everyone. And what I'd like to do is start with our student leaders and um, just have you tell us um, your name and your major and which student organization you represent. And then we will uh, have the, the guests introduce themselves and then you can start asking your questions. So Presley, you're in my upper left corner. I'll start with you. Hi, my name is Presley Sharp. I'm from Delta Sigma Pi, the Theta Omega chapter of St. Edwards, and I'm studying marketing. Thank you for having me. Jennifer? Yeah, thank you. Um, my name is Jennifer Butterfield. I'm a business administration major. I am the president of the accounting club at St. Edwards University. Glad to be here too. Thank you. Shauna? Um, hi, yes, Shauna Grillo, um, finance major, also uh, Delta Sigma Pi. So when we'll have some finance stuff to talk about. I'm sure we've yeah. had all the same professors. And uh, say hi. Hi, my name is Sage Mike. I'm a business administration major and I'm here representing Delta Mi Delta. Well, thank you all of you uh, for uh, stepping up and offering to serve as our moderators. Um, let me now have our guests um, introduce themselves. I'll start with Anel. Hi, my name is Anel Mihio Chen, and I graduated from St. Edwards. My BBA was in 2013. My MBA was in 2014. My major for BBA was international business with a regional emphasis on Japan, Asia, and my MBA was global entrepreneurship. During my time at St. Ed's, I actually was part of Delta Mu Delta as well, um, and I loved it there, and I'm happy to be here. I'm currently a um, human resources consultant, as well as a board member for both Austin Oida Sister City Committee and the Japan America Society of Greater Austin. Thanks. Welcome, Anel. Um, Wynn? Yeah, thank you guys for having me. My name is uh, Wynn Smith. I graduated from St. Ed's with a BBA in finance in 2012. Uh, and I work in commercial real estate uh, here in Austin. I'm a partner at a firm called Riverside Resources. Um, I actually started interning at the firm my senior year at St. Ed's. Thanks, welcome Wynn and Richard. Hi, my name is Richard Allen. I graduated with my uh, MBA from St. Edwards in 2001 with a concentration in human resources management. And I am also, also also was a member of Delta Mu Delta while I was a student at uh, St. Edwards. And I'm a human resources specialist with the uh, Texas Facilities Commission here in Austin in the uh, downtown capital complex area. And I support the uh, senior leadership uh, of the uh, commission to uh, bring in talent acquisition uh, for the agency. Okay, thanks Richard and welcome. And Shania, you. um, I, your face just popped on the screen. Are you also gonna be moderating? I didn't think so. I thought I was okay. just attending. Okay. But I hope it's- You've, got a, plan. You've got a moderator link though. That's why your face is on the screen, okay. Well, welcome. You are welcome to stay right where you are. Um, all right. Well, I am going to turn it over to our moderators then. Um, and I'm not sure which one of you wants to ask the first question, but whoever it is, go ahead. Yes, um, I could ask the first question. 
So um, can you describe the path you chose upon graduation and briefly review the roles that you've experienced in your career thus far? You might have to call on somebody to start. <laughs> um, when you can go first. <laughs> sure, yeah. Um, you know, I, I, uh, I didn't know what I wanted to do when I was at St. Ed's and I just started uh, working and I took a few different internships, uh, first in an accounting firm, then at an e-commerce firm, then financial services, and then ultimately uh, at the real estate firm that I'm with now. And uh, after working in those different roles, I really enjoyed the uh, the experience of real estate. Uh, it's different every day. Um, you're impacting the really the the lives of the people around you, like living in where they live or going to the office eight hours a day and hopefully giving them a good environment to be productive uh, for themselves and their families and society. Uh, and so that was an easy transition when I was interning at my current firm to just stay on board um, after, uh, after college. And I just had lucky timing uh, with the economy heading in the right direction in 2012. The roles that I've handled while I've been there, it's pretty entrepreneurial environment. Um, so I started out just leasing space, leasing office space to folks, and then also managing the, the construction of those spaces after they were leased. Uh, and then that transitions into um, buying and selling buildings, uh, buying a piece of land to envision uh, a development on it that uh, benefits the surrounding area and, and is also economically feasible. Um, and uh, it's really a, just a kind of a deal by deal basis. Uh, keep, keep going and, and, uh, and see where it takes you. Uh, so I'd say it's a, it was a pretty fluid uh, transition, not very linear or, uh, or plotted. Um, and uh, that's been a fun journey along the way. Okay, so Anel, do you want? Would you like to go next? Yeah, my journey is similar but a little different after St. Ed's. So I actually worked while I was at St. Ed's as well because I've always been curious about the business world. And I was actually working at like a um, bubble tea and Japanese gift store while I was at St. Ed's. And I left there to do a marketing internship with St. David's um, Hospital, the South location and the North location, because I wanted to get more from life. I felt like I understood the small business world. Um, I had worked my way up from like tea server to assistant manager at that tea shop. I understood the food industry. So I'm like, let me tap into this other industry. And I loved it there. When my internship was over, I really felt more of a passion for administrative work. I joined a HR consulting firm and I was a consultant and a recruiter at that firm. It was startup culture, small biz, team of four women working with local Austin businesses. And it was a lot of fun, but I learned I did not like recruiting <laughs> through that experience. And after that job, I then, um, during this time also, I joined the Austin OIDA board. And so I was doing, you know, uh, not, like pro bono work for a uh, nonprofit. And I really, really loved doing that. I love serving the community. They host a festival every year. I got, it helped me big deeper roots with the Japanese community here. I got to study abroad in Japan at, during my time at St. Edwards. And that's kind of where that all connected. And it kept me in touch with a lot of those people. And then I switched to working for a nonprofit, I thought, you know, I really love nonprofit work, what it's like working for a nonprofit. And I worked at a nonprofit that taught entrepreneurship to kids. So they taught, you know, kids how to be their own business owner. And that was really rewarding and fun. And then the pandemic hit and after school activities weren't as big. And so they downsized. And around that time, I also was having my own kiddo. And so I began doing my own consulting firm on my own because of time and, you know, better for my schedule and the better way I work and working with clients personally, because I really loved doing that consulting work. And so 
then I joined another board because <laughs> I really do enjoy giving back to the community. And the work I do for the boards is very much HR related, but also like event planning and, you know, volunteer work too. Thank you. Richard? I kind of uh, was like the other young lady. I kind of had a, a unconventional way of uh, getting into HR when I first got my bachelor's degree in general business from uh, Houston Tillerson University uh, here in Austin. I worked for about, I guess, seven or eight years. And then, then I decided that I wanted to go back to uh, graduate school and chose St. Edwards, <clears throat> chose, chose St. Edwards and got uh, uh, involved in the, uh, the MBA with a concentration uh, in human resources management. And what I did was I took a Myers-Briggs test uh, when I was in graduate school to see which field I would be uh, probably most interested in. And it came back with human resources management. So I uh, got my degree. And uh, when I got my degree back in 2001, that's when uh, the crash hit. That's when they were laying off a lot of uh, individuals and employees from high tech industries. So it took me a while to actually uh, get into HR, but what I did was I did a lot of networking, uh, did a lot of uh, HR consulting, working with a lot of different uh, nonprofits and small companies. And then I got a job with the Texas Workforce Commission where I was a workforce development specialist. And uh, I worked with uh, job seekers that were looking for jobs in all types of fields. And I really enjoyed doing that. And I got, got, uh, got into training people how to look for jobs and resume writing and cover letters and did a lot of training about uh, using, the, uh, using your resources to find a job. And then after that, I uh, applied for a job with the Texas Facilities Commission about five years ago and uh, got a job in uh, talent acquisition and recruiting and really found out that uh, that was my strength. And uh, this last fiscal year that just ended, I brought in over 100 people to our organization. So I'm really, uh, really proud of that. And one of the things that I enjoy about talent acquisition and recruiting is that you build relationships, not only with universities like St. Edwards and UT and Houston Tillerson, but you also uh, build relationships with grassroots organizations and people that are uh, actively looking for jobs. And some of, the, some of the people that I've actually recruited uh, to the position or to the agency has been our executive director, our chief information officer, and then uh, our director of uh, human resources. And so we have a small team, uh, it's four of us, but we recruit, but we assist, I should say, we assist close, assist close to 400 employees so we really do. Uh, we really do an excellent job. And one of the things that I kind of love about my job is that I not only uh, learn uh, more and more about recruiting, but I learn about how the organization works. Uh, so so far as strategic leadership, strategic management, uh, how comp and benefits work, how leave works, because we all uh, work with each other in one way or another. And so that uh, makes the organization uh, run a lot smoother. And then I've also learned a lot about strategic leadership, how you have to be a strategic leader to uh, make an organization run. And so with that, uh, HR has, and I feel like in my role, I have a very uh, important role because uh, when we bring employees in, uh, they're the first face that they see. I, I interact with everybody uh, in the agency and I do the new hire orientation and uh, I also do uh, interviewing uh, with our strategic leaders. And so it's, it's a rewarding role and uh, really feel good about it because uh, what I've learned uh, at St. Edwards uh, in a lot of the uh, graduate courses is uh, ethics and that is very important in uh, just about any position but it's really important in HR and a lot of the classes that I took even 20 years ago when I graduated in 2001 I still use a lot of the uh, classwork to uh, apply to my job uh, that I'm doing right now today. Awesome. 
those are great stories. It's really inspiring to hear. Thank you, Richard. Um, Thank you. We have our next question, and the order I would like to go in is Anel, Richard, then Wynn. Um, did you do any internships during your time as an undergraduate? Um, if so, can you tell us how that influenced your path forward after graduation? And if not, um, or if you'd like to elaborate on your extracurriculars during St. Edwards, um, that'd be awesome. Thank you. Yeah, so I didn't do an internship in my undergraduate. I did it during my MBA because during my undergraduate, I actually was working. I had made a goal to buy a, myself a way to go to visit Japan. After studying abroad, I wanted to go back and I was like, I need money and most internships are unpaid. And so during my time at St. Ed's, I worked and saved that money and tried to, um, and then, and so, but I was also involved in an organization at St. Ed's. I was part of the buddy program with the International Office of Education with the APU students. So every time they came and visited, I was one of the lead buddies. Sometimes I had one to two students assigned to me where I would have to take them around Austin, teach them about American culture, help them with studying abroad. And uh, that was something that I really enjoyed. I made lifelong friends through that program, both here and there. I really loved doing that. I was part of um, some other organizations like clubs and things like that. Like I would visit, I wasn't really a full member. But the buddy program took up a lot of my time because they had a spring and summer semester. I lived in Austin during my time, so I was here during the summer, so I was able to participate then. Um, and, and then I mentioned the marketing internship I did with St. David's Hospital, and that was a lot of fun. I actually really enjoyed doing marketing for a hospital. You think it would be, it's different because they have their own PR team, so it was strictly marketing, and that was really fun to do. And they're a for-profit slash non-profit, so understanding how to do marketing on that side, like on the you know for-profit side was something I really enjoyed as well. And it, I honestly think getting involved in organizations, getting involved in programming is just not a great way to network, but it's a great way to learn new skill sets as well. And you never know who you're gonna meet or what you're gonna learn. And so I really enjoyed doing extracurricular activities and even working or doing an internship too. I don't know if that answers your question fully. Oh, thanks. I also have a follow-up question for you. Yeah. Um, before St. Edwards, um, before the buddy program you were part of, did you know that you wanted to take your career into nonprofit and into helping people with business? No. So um, I, my parents are both doctors. So I always thought I was going to go medical, hence the St. David's internship. And I knew I cared about helping others and medicine is a great way to help people. And I never even thought about nonprofit until I met with Austin Oweda Sister City Committee. Um, we they were, they worked with St. Edwards back then too. They used to have a, they did an event on campus, and I met them. And the St. Ed's, the school I studied abroad at APU, is located near Oita, and so that was my way to stay connected. And I realized, oh man, this is really fun, and I really enjoy this. And I it started very simple. I remember I met at a coffee shop with. Um, a member of the board and they invited me to a board meeting and then I just kept showing up as a volunteer and then they invited me to join the board and I, I haven't looked back since. <laughs> awesome, thank you. I'm just going to do a refresher of the question for Richard and Wynn. Um, did you do any internships during your time as an undergraduate or when you were a graduate during St. Edwards? Um, if so, could you tell us how that influenced your path forward after graduation? Uh, that's an interesting question. When I was an undergraduate way back when in the 80s, uh, I didn't do really an internship. They called it like co-op. And it was kind of similar to an internship where you got credit for it. And I was, uh, I had, I was a co-op student at the uh, Veterans Administration Data Processing Center uh, because my, uh, my, my minor during that time was in computer science. And so I took that opportunity to uh, learn uh, in a work environment, uh, learn more about computer science. Uh, but then when I uh, became a graduate student at St. Edwards, I was working at the Public Utility Commission of Texas in the uh, Consumer Affairs Division where I was investigating uh, complaints that customers had against uh, telephone companies and electric companies. And I think that's where I really got my passion for helping people. But coincidentally, uh, where my office was situated, it was right next to the HR department. 
So I got to know the HR specialist and I got to know the HR director very well. And so the, I would always ask them uh, HR related questions and they, they allowed me to do uh, a little bit of HR work just to kind of get some experience, even though that was not, you know, my uh, primary job responsibilities. So that's really kind of the way I started becoming interested in HR. Uh, but I was working full time at the PUC, but then I also interacted again with the HR director and the HR specialist. And that kind of uh, propelled me to, uh, you know, go for a uh, career in HR. So I kind of changed my career somewhat to get into HR. Thank you. Um, and when? Yeah, um, I'm, I mentioned uh, previously that I interned at a few different places while I was in school. Uh, and I think it was really important for my personal development to decide what I liked, what I didn't like, where I wanted to go. And so I didn't really know what I wanted to do until something, one of my internships grabbed me and it felt really comfortable. But it took me until my third or fourth internship to feel that way. So I think it, I would highly recommend uh, interning when you can uh, and having multiple different internships. And then, uh, you know, one of the big benefits that I, I think I was able to take advantage of, the last place I interned, they were very uh, trusting. So there was, it was a pretty uh, independent environment where I could go out and I had a backstop where I could uh, get coaching and get mentored and have, an and have questions answered when I have them, when I had them, but they also promoted an environment where it was okay to make mistakes. And I mean, just like generally experience uh, is the best teacher. And so being put in an environment where I could make mistakes and then learn from them and uh, be given the confidence to go out and try again uh, was a really uh, impactful, uh, probably personal development that I garnered through internships. Thank you. I will take the torch from here um, and open up with our third question. Um, and why don't we hear from Richard and Nell and then when you can close us out again, if that's okay. Um, so given each of your talents and interests, um, was there an aha moment or a moment that you realized um, you were in the right spot? Um, and could you share a little bit about that with us? Mm, that's kind of a hard question. I mean, cause I think it, it, it really has to do with uh, what your passion is and what, you're, what you really enjoy doing. And sometimes that can take, you know, uh, it can take, a, take some time to find out uh, what, you're, what you're really good at. But I think probably my aha moment was when I started getting really good at my job and uh, people started really respecting me and, and uh, really, I guess I would say empowering me, like strategic leadership empowering me, uh, letting me know that I was doing a good job and that I was uh, representing the agency in, in a positive way. Because when you're uh, in talent acquisition or recruiting, you really have to, It's you're not only just uh, representing the uh, organization, but you're also representing yourself. So it's very important that when you're out there talking to people, uh, visiting with people that you uh, put your best foot forward and that you represent whoever you're, whoever you're working for, your, your company or your organization or your state agency in a professional way. And one of the things I always ask myself is did I do a good job? Did I do the best I could do? And I think that's, I think it's good to ask yourself those questions because it uh, challenges, challenges you to do better at what you do. I mean, you can, 
uh, do a good job, but then I think you can also learn from just uh, doing things differently or learning to do things better. And uh, I think that's what's really helped me is just you, uh, it doesn't matter how old you get or how long you've been out of graduate school or undergraduate school, you're always learning. So if you're always learning, you're always trying to, uh, to do your best. And uh, I don't know if that really answered your question, but I think it's just important to know what your passion is and know uh, what, you're, what you're good at. And one of the things I always you know, uh, recommend to people when I'm talking to them is play to your strengths. And then when you can play to your strengths, that will make you uh, just a better employee. That'll make you better at your profession because you're, you're using your talents and your strengths, your God-given strengths that, that, uh, that God has given you. And we all have different gifts. We all have different uh, strengths that, that we have uh, that's given to us by God. But I always say you have to uh, use those strengths and use those passions that you're good at. And that'll make you uh, that'll make you successful. And then once you know that, you'll know that you're in the right profession or the right career. Thank you so much, Richard. That that did answer the question from your perspective. I appreciate it. You know, it's really identifiable um, what you shared because I think so many of us are trying to figure it out as we go along, and it's really reassuring to hear that perspective. Um, so thank you. Anel. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, so it's, I wouldn't say it's an aha moment to slow build. And it starts with how would you define success? Everyone defines success differently. Uh, whether it's, you know, certain goals you want to meet, certain outcomes you want to meet. For me, I learned my de definition of success is impact. I like doing change in the world. I like making a difference. I like giving back. And one thing I noticed now thinking back on it, every job I left for whatever reason, whether it was like I left to move on or, you know, maybe, you know, there's layoffs, things like that. Every time it was time for that separation, my bosses were always in tears and like always like never wanting to have me go. And it was always something where I am still connected with most of them today. Or like we have some kind of relationship, whether it's on LinkedIn or personal, even with some of my coworkers. I have friends from coworkers from my first job that I still keep in touch with and seeing the impact I had on their lives, seeing the difference that I made. And HR is kind of like being a mom or a professor for businesses, especially as a consultant. They're coming to you being like, mom, fix this for me. This is, I need help with this. And you're having a problem solve with them. You're having to, you know, it's onboarding, it's creativity, it's brainstorming, it's ideation. It's so many different aspects to it. And seeing the impact that I have on those businesses or community with my nonprofit work and seeing how excited people are. You know, this past festival, we do a major festival every year at the Asian American Resource Center. Um, we had over like 800 attendees and as people were leaving the door, they were having such a blast because, you know, we had all these performances, we had opportunities to learn about doing business in Japan, um, activities about learning about Japanese culture, eating Japanese food and stuff like that. And it was a lot of people's exposure, first time exposure to it and seeing this like shine in their eyes of, I want more. I want to learn more. I want to do more. How can I get involved? How can I do this? This was wonderful. And seeing that excitement build in others, I take a lot of joy in seeing others thrive and seeing that at every career I've done that with and seeing that HR, like Richard said earlier, we get to talk to everyone. We get to talk to every department and you get to interact with so many different kinds of people and you get to learn from all those different kinds of people. And that's kind of for me where I was like, man, like, I think this is where I'm at and why I'm not in the medical world as I thought I would be. <laughs> thank you so much and now i'm now i'm curious about the festivals I, I, those sound really fun <laughs> and i see the japanese art that you have behind you too that's really neat um thank you for sharing and um when what insights do you have to offer on this one well first i thought those were great answers by richard and anel and i don't know if i can uh if I'm the right one to close it out, but I totally agree with uh, finding your your passion and what you're uh, motivated to do. Um, and honestly, I don't think that there's like one aha moment. Like, I think it just continues to evolve. Like it's a slow, steady climb 
with some downturns as well. Um, mm -hmm. but one, one of the things that uh, that I uh, I think struck me was was seeing failure and uh, finding the resolve to climb out of that failure because ultimately that's what you're all we're all going to have to do in our careers regularly and then sure. build confidence through uh through mm -hmm. the resolve um and and sometimes like on the inverse sometimes i'll like realize a re really big success of something that i've been working on for a long time months years and it comes together and you get to the other side of that success and maybe you put too much value on it. Like you think this success is gonna be so fulfilling. You get to the other side and you're like, oh, wow, I feel the exact same as I did the, the day before. This is not the feeling that I thought I was gonna get from this. So being able to really enjoy the people that you're working with and the process, uh, you, you, gotta, you gotta feel good about that. I always tell people like when you're getting your first job or one of your first jobs, it's it's way more important to go work for the right person than the, the right corporation or company because that person mm -hmm. has impact your life way more than a corporation um mm -hmm. so i kind of work I, I don't know if i completely answered your question but uh forgive my tr my train of thought there <laughs> oh no it was a really beautiful organic flow thank you so much and um thanks to all of you for answering that question i'm going to pass it off to our question four. Yes, um, I'll be asking question four. So in the order would be Anel, Wynn, and then um, if Richard could close it off for us. And the question is, if you were entering the profession now, what changes would you make to how you prepared yourself for success? So I'm gonna touch a little bit about what Wen finished on, and that would be find a mentor. Find someone who is willing to guide you to answer those questions. Like, you know, it is so key to have someone that can, you know, you can research in Google all you want, but there's certain things that talking to someone that's been through it and has insights from it that really helps. And that actually helped me in my first job, I guess, because it was after I graduated, like not the tea shop, but the consulting firm I had, that boss was a boss and a mentor. Um, I could go to her with HR questions or ask about certain policies and procedures. And that was my entry into the field. And she took the time to kind of train me and mentor me into um, the, the style of HR she does. And I was able to develop my own style of HR from that from that as well. And I, you know, I wish that I had a mentor starting earlier on in college, having someone, I had some professors that worked, I used to always go to office hours with professors. Um, Dr. Zayner was a professor that I was great with ethics advice. <laughs> if you ever need to know about international business, um, I used to talk with uh, Professor Cecil Lawson, who was in more of the Japanese side. And having that guide really helped me feel more confident in my, like what I wanted, as well as, you know, not afraid to ask questions about being penal penalized. And that's something that I would do is keep that like a mentorship program, keep learning, growing. And it doesn't hurt to ask. Like, you know, it's always intimidating when you see like a big honcho, big CEO person, but a lot of people want to mentor. There's so many of those VPs, directors that want to give back and want to do something. And you're, and they're like, yeah, like I'll grab a cup of coffee with you and talk to you about business. Like I, interf um, informational interviewing, is a great way to learn about an industry. And I started doing that after I graduated and I wish I did it during while I was at school because I could have learned more about the market and see what other options I had while I was still a student. And yeah, it's it just talking to people, networking, definitely networking. Apparently Wednesday nights are really big in the networking world. I, I noticed that as a fun generation when I was working at nonprofits, there's always a networking event happening on Wednesday night. So, I mean, there's events out there where you can meet so many great uh, people in the business world in different industries. Um, I have a quick follow up to that. I know I asked you the other follow up, so forgive me. But, um, um, if you're not yet in the commercial world, um, how would you suggest doing that um, as an undergrad? Like for inter uh, a mentor. In so there, there are a few organizations that offer mentorship programs. Um, Honestly, a quick Google search. I know even like Austin Digital Jobs has a mentorship program. Like there's so many out there. Even St. Edwards has um, resources too. 
but it just doesn't hurt to look up what networking events are happening. Capital Factory has events all the time and you can just go and meet people and you never know who you're gonna meet. Um, also, I've done this before. If there is a company you're interested in or a um, like organization, sending an email out for an, an informational interview, like, hey, I'm really interested in this field. Would you mind, you know, meeting me and talking about it? And even if they say no, someone is going to say yes, because someone's like, yes, I want to advise. I want to teach. Um, Chamber of Commerce also do a lot of events. So I've gone to a few of those. Um, and like and any type of organization in your field, like if you are a law major, the bar associations have all these different organizations and events too that have mentoring program. Like there's there's a lot out there and it's shocking. How you, you wouldn't even think like, wow, there's an organization for that. There is, like, it's crazy, especially in Austin. And the Chamber of Commerce is a great way to go for business. If you're going more for law, definitely your local bar association, um, any alumni network or even just, any business you have an interest in, like if there's, and just find someone that's in a department that you like, you know, sometimes they have a email for HR or something like that, or connect on LinkedIn is a great way. Like if you see someone like, hey, this person's a marketing person at like Deloitte, like shoot them a message being like, hey, I'm really interested in being a marketing consulting. Like, how did you get in this field? And a lot of them are happy to help. Thank you. Yeah, thank you again, Anel. Um, if Wade would like to go next. Sure thing. Um, you know, like as someone who's just starting, the the thing that I think is most important, no matter what you're doing, at least from my experience, like when I'm working with a, a not young person out of school, uh, you've got to follow through, like under promise and over deliver. If you say you're going to do something, do it, and pay close attention to the details. Uh, and if you don't know the answer or know the next step, once you've gathered data or taken the first step, that's okay. It's also okay uh, if someone asks you a question and you don't know the answer, just say, I don't know the answer to that, but let me get back to you. Don't feel obligated to uh, you know, BS your way through because people will just see straight through that and you'll lose your credibility. And then, you know, like Anel mentioned, don't be scared to ask. Like, what's the worst thing that can happen if you ask? You're in the same position that you are without asking. So if you have a question or you want to meet somebody or reach out or uh, try something, um, ask. And people, you know, I, we're, uh, Richard and Anel and I are probably all on here because people helped us and we want to give back too. But we're here because someone asked us to be. And so uh, we wouldn't have done this without that. So I'd say that uh, you know, those three things, no matter what you're doing, just like interpersonally are, are important for building credibility and trust with whatever you're doing and then be given more responsibility. And ultimately, that's how you grow. Thank you. That was really helpful and reassuring for sure. <laughs> and Richard, if you would like to answer. Uh, <clears throat> if I was starting out again, many moons ago, <laughs> what I would tell uh, young people is have a good resume, get you some business cards and be a go-getter because networking happens everywhere. Uh, there's a couple of job clubs that I was a member of. One is called Hire Texas. And then the other one is called Austin Job Seekers Network. And networking, uh, Anel brought it up, but networking happens anywhere. I give you a good example. Uh, when I was looking for a job, I had a current resume and uh, I had some business cards made. And this can apply, you know, to uh, young people in college that, you know, may be looking for an internship or co-op. But I was at a service station getting some gas and there was a gentleman that drove up and we just started talking and uh, found out later he was a CEO of a company. And he asked me what kind of job I was looking for. And I said, well, I'm looking for something HR related. He took my resume, took my business card, and I got an interview two days later. 
So uh, networking happens anywhere. I mean, you can be in, you can be uh, at uh, HEB, you know, you can be like at a service station, you can be anywhere. But I would tell, tell young people not to be afraid, not to be afraid to talk to people because you never know who you're gonna cross paths with. You never know who that person might be in the uh, checkout line, might be Michael Dale. You know, you just don't know. And so I think network happens, you know, all the time. I mean, there's a lot of, with Austin being such a young, vibrant uh, community and having many types of jobs, it does, you don't have to go to like a formal place where network is happening. Uh, network happens all the time. I would just, you know, uh, let young people know, be a go-getter and uh, be ready to talk to anybody and, uh, you know, have a good resume, have a current resume, even though you might not have like work experience per se as a professional, you can put uh, information on there like internships you've done while you, while you were undergraduate at St. Edwards. You can put down part-time jobs that you've done, uh, but just have a really good resume and then get a good set of business cards and uh, that'll open up a lot of doors. I think sometimes people think about, you know, networking is that, you know, you have to go to some organization to network. You know, you can go anywhere and network, but I, another organization that's really good too for uh, young people is uh, the Austin Human Resources Management Association. Uh, the acronym for it is ARMA, and they have over 800 professional uh, HR people that uh, that are involved in ARMA, but you don't have to be actually interested in HR, but you have to go where you think there are going to be some people that can help you get a job. And so you can be, you know, very creative about, you know, how you look for a job and how you, how you search for a job and then how, you know, you can get, uh, like I think Anel mentioned earlier about how you can get uh, mentors. Uh, because like she said, and I agree with it, there's a lot of people out there that uh, want to help, uh, you know, young people and mentor to them. But you have to be willing to go out there and not be afraid and ask questions. And, uh, you know, I'm the type, uh, there's a, uh, a quote by uh, Malcolm X, by all means necessary. And so when you're a young person and you're looking for a job, you need to use all resources that you can. And one of the things that people uh, have said about me and that admired me was that I would use all my resources. Uh, and I think that's what you have to do is you have to really kind of, you know, you can go to networking groups, but you also have to kind of think outside the box too. And that's really what's good in HR is that, you know, you might be doing something one way, but is there a better way to do it? And that's, you can also use that same uh, uh, approach to when you're looking for jobs and trying to get uh, mentors, you know, be creative, think outside of the box, you know, think of people that you might know. And, and not only people you might know, ask your family and your friends, because your family and your friends, a lot of times will have a lot of information that you might not even know about. And so I would always say use your resources and don't just think of uh, networking as going to some, you know, some group because networking happens everywhere. I'm not saying you shouldn't go to those groups and those organizations, but think of other ways to network other than just kind of like people think of the traditional networking. Thank you, Richard. That was a really helpful response to show the power of networking, how it's all around us. Um, and now I'd like to pass it to Presley for our next question. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go in the order of Richard first. You already kind of brushed on this. And then Wynn and then Anel. And the question is, in your opinion, what makes a candidate stellar and highly competitive in today's market? Whoa. Hmm. That's a good question. I would say... What makes a candidate stellar is one that has uh, researched the company, uh, knows about the company, knows what the company is doing, uh, knows what the mission of the company is, 
uh, knows what the goals of the research goals of the company are. Uh, I do new hire orientation. And one of the first things I ask uh, new hires is what do you know about what the Texas Facility Commission does? What do you know about our strategic goals? And, and uh, what do you know about our mission? What, is, what does our mission statement say? And boy, when you ask people a question like that, you talking about a deer in the headlight look, it's, uh, it's really funny, but that's to me is what makes a person, you know, stand out, a candidate stand out, you know, one that has gone, gone, gone above and beyond just going to an interview and answering the interview question, but one that has actually researched the company, knows something about the company, knows something about the leaders, know something about what the company is doing. And, uh, you know, those type of people, you know, stand out, especially in an interview, because, you know, they're, they're people that can interview well, real well, but just because a person interviews real well doesn't mean they're going to do real well in that job. And then there are some people that don't interview real well, and they do well in the job. But I think that one of the things that will help them help a, help a candidate, in my opinion, stand out as somebody that has uh, actually done the leg work and I would say the footwork to know about what that company uh, does, what that company stands for, what that company's involved in, what that company has stood, you know, what they've done uh, socially, what they've done out in the community, uh, what they've done to help other people. So I think that's uh, that helps to me, in my opinion, that helps a candidate stand out than just a candidate that, uh, you know, shows up for the interviews on time and and can answer your question because it's 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 uh, there's a lot of jobs out here and it's very competitive out here. But you want somebody that actually knows something about the company, knows what their role is going to be in the company and knows how they're going to impact that company through the role that they have. What are they going to do in that role and how that role is going to impact that company uh, in a positive way. Great answer. Thank you, Richard. Um, Wins? Yeah, I think Richard's spot on. And, and uh, to be fair, he's done a lot more hiring than I have. And so uh, <laughs> I just would reiterate ex exactly what, what he said and also uh, offer... Um, you know, like generally you want to be a lifelong learner. So I want to see somebody who is engaged uh, and, and you can feel that they're passionate about what they're interviewing for uh, and that they're going to even outside of that be a, be a life, lifelong learner and just as an individual seek to always get better. I'm a, uh, I'm reading a book right now that uh, David Rubenstein wrote. He's the founder of uh, Carlisle Group, a big institutional investor. And uh, he just went around and interviewed a bunch of professional investors uh, and asked them questions about their background and kind of the essence of trying to get to the essence of why they've been so successful. And one of the things that always comes out in all the interviews is uh, being a lifelong learner and being perceptive to your environment. So I think you guys coming from St. Ed's, a liberal arts school, like that's an advantage. A lot of the people that I are my peers when I started came from the bigger state schools, UT, a and other places like that. And they were in those bigger class formats and maybe their degree program was more heavily emphasized on uh, mathematics or something like that, but the the uh, the balance at St. Ed's between business classes and liberal arts classes is a much, in my biased opinion, a much more well-rounded education. And like really, that liberal arts edge uh, turns you into a lifelong learner, and it puts you in a position uh, to. Uh, to be a better reader, writer, communicator than some of those folks that have never had to really pay much attention to that. And that's an advantage. Um, and so I think you guys are in a great position to 
build off of that liberal arts education that that you've been enjoying and honestly like i look back the classes that i enjoyed just as much as any others are all the liberal arts classes and i would love to go take one again like years later that'd be fun uh, <laughs> so just know that like you guys are well positioned to take advantage of that uh and just try to communicate passion and then also that you're uh a lifelong learner and then also show up in professional attire like i i think that's important you know where austin's become more of a casual environment uh, i think everywhere probably has since covid but you don't know who you're talking to or what they're going to be dressed like so it's better to be overdressed than underdressed so i, I would apply that from a practical perspective mm -hmm. I really appreciate that perspective. I haven't thought of that one before and I haven't heard that one before. So I really appreciate that. Um, Anel? So I'm gonna touch on a little bit of what they said and a little bit, it's gonna seem out there, but to, there's no right answer to the question you actually asked because each profession is different, right? My ideal candidate for a computer engineer, like a software engineer, and a administrator is going to be two different people. And I'm going to be looking for two different things in those candidates. Uh, technical interviews look way different than an interview we've seen. Same with, I've done a chef interview before. It's delicious, but it's completely different than what you think you would do for any type of hire. And so honestly, it's a lot of research, 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 kind of what Richard was saying is know the company, know their culture, know them specifically, because every company has what they call an ideal candidate. I have created ideal candidate portfolios for a bunch of different clients. And usually that ideal candidate is always the same personality type, but it varies per company, even per industry. And finding that good fit for you, what's a good match for you? Like, obviously, like you go in the interview, you like always overdress over underdress, you know, um, even though you'll look like the only person, if you're, if you're a software engineer, this is business school, like they're always casual and things like that. And, but I always, I always highlight, yeah, always overdress always know the company, always research it, and always understand like what you want. Don't be afraid to ask questions. I, when candidates ask me follow-up questions, I love that because it shows me that they're really engaged in the role, especially if they ask role-specific questions or company-specific questions that I didn't touch base on. The fact that they're wanting to learn more, the fact that they want to know more about the role shows that they're engaged and interested. You can tell real quick who has not, like who has researched the company and who hasn't looked into the role at all especially the mm -hmm. basic job description. And so knowing that mm -hmm. I also say high charisma because, you know, e even if it's just for a second, even if it's not just in your nature, charisma can get you a long way. Cause even if you don't have the answer or answer, right, people remember you and you want to be remembered in that interview. You don't want to just mm -hmm. be another name, another face. You want to stick out and be like, you know what? She may not have like this one specific certification or sales training, but I feel like she could easily get it and she feels great to work with. And that could be a way to pivot it because that can open the door for you. Even if you don't have all the qualifications that a job description has, don't be afraid to apply because mm -hmm. it could train you yeah. or you could learn on the job if it's something simple and specific to that company. So don't hesitate for that. Mm -hmm. And there's, there, it's, it's, there's so much, I, think, like, I do this for the other side of it, where I'm like looking at these candidates and resumes, and I look for specific things for specific jobs, like it varies in what you're looking for. A marketing person is completely different from an accounting person. You know, I'm looking for a more extroverted person if I'm talking marketing, but I, I an accountant doesn't necessarily have to be extroverted there. I want them to know the books. I want them to be good at this. Like there are certain qualifications that just make an ideal candidate the way there is. And if you don't match with someone right away, because there's also that culture piece, just because a company's in a certain industry, their cultures are completely different. And there's different work environments. Like, are you more a team player? Do you work best solo? Is it a hybrid model? Like, there's so many elements that go into an ideal candidate, an ideal workflow. And knowing that about yourself and playing to those strengths of knowing the keywords in a job description. So, you know, if a job description is saying fast paced environment, knowing what that means, they're telling you that it's going to be long hours. There's a lot of work. Um, there's a, you know, uh, like deadlines are quick to turnarounds, like knowing what that means if it's fast paced, knowing what it means if they say it's a team model or if they want to go getter, like knowing what the, they use so many tricks and keywords to give you hints of what their ideal candidate is. 
when you're applying to a job, match your resume to that job description. Use those same keywords. Use those same, like, like they want to show that you match their flow. You match their culture. There's so mm -hmm. much that can, you can make yourself the ideal candidate. And that's why it's such a, it's just a straight, like for me, I'm like, there's no right answer to that question. Cause you can, you're, you can be a chameleon almost in a sense where uh, I have multiple resumes, right? I have a master resume that has all of my experience and everything. But when I apply to a job, I take what's like relates to the job I'm applying to. Cause some of my experience might not be relatable, but I take what is relatable and put it onto that resume for that job specific. Cause they'll ask you about any gaps. They'll ask you about anything. And you can talk about that in an interview, but always have follow-up questions, use their language, match their culture, match their temperament, their vibe. You know, it's, you know, go professionally dressed for sure. And so like, it's really like studying and analyzing the company you're applying for. I don't know if that <laughs> helps any. Wow, now I'm excited to apply for some internships and I feel ready, more ready than ever. Um, thank you for all three of you for their answers. Um, I'm gonna hand it over to Jennifer for the last question we have written down. Thanks. Um... Okay, let's talk more about um, interview experiences. Um, do you guys have any uh, best or worst candidate experiences? Um, feel free to be candid. Um, or, I mean, in essence, what not to do or, or what was really a standout in an interview? I know you guys touched a little bit on that, but... Um, I'm sure you guys can pinpoint a little bit more. And let's see, when do you want to kick us off since you closed us out on my last question? Yeah, sure, no worries. Um, you know, I'm trying to best and worst. I, I now really hit something uh, that spoke to me. You want to be memorable. And so like probably the, the worst interviews are the ones that are dull and not engaging don't have that charisma that she mentioned and I don't remember like I, I've had uh we interview people a, a lot and and it's not easy like and I know sitting in the interviewer sheet that there is stress on this person right now and so like being nervous or um uh, seeming that way, that's no problem at all. So don't worry about that. Uh, having thoughtful responses to answers uh, and then ask, being able to think in that stressed state and ask a follow-up question is really impactful. And it's, it's uh, Richard was spot on. Like I've hired some people uh, that have been really good at in, in their interview and they didn't work out as well uh, as employees. Um, and then there's been others where uh, it wasn't the best interview and we, but we went for it and like they are rock star employees. And so I, the other two will know better than me, but like as a seasoned, and seasoned hiring person, you recognize like the interview is not everything, but doing everything that you can in that moment and leading into it, preparation uh, is, is very important because that's ultimately what, you know, what we're looking for is somebody who's detail oriented and is going to take it seriously uh, and is willing to uh, work hard and, and be prepared. Thank you so much. Yeah, I feel like, um, I don't know, at least in my mind, I've always um, gone into this idea that like the nervousness of an interview is going to be the part that, you know, is discounting in my my candidacy and so I'm I'm really glad that you touched on that because it's so important to acknowledge that um, we're all human we all feel those emotions it's really about um, the engagement so thank you um, let's see Richard would you like to answer this question I, I'm happy to repeat it um, do you have interview experiences with candidates that you can share that are the best or worst candidate experiences? Um, what's a, a do or do not in a in an interview? Uh, I think when he he really touched on one of the key things is when you go into an interview, be prepared. 
And in in uh, HR, there's a thing called behavioral interviewing. And basically what that means is there's an acronym called SARS and it's S-A-R. And basically what SARS means, the S stands for situation. The A means action. And then the R means what was the result. And so when, when you're interviewing, you need to have examples of what you did in a position. It could be, you know, in a professional position, it could be in an internship position, it could be in a co-op position. And so what you wanna do is they call them little short stories. So tell me a short story about when this happened, what was the situation, what action did you take and what was the result? And so you have to think up different short stories, you know, what you did in different situations. And one of the things you have to do in interviewing is listen to what they're asking you. And you need to listen intently to what they're asking you and then answer their question as best you can. One of the, I think one of the worst things, you know, uh, that I've seen in, in interviews is, uh, when a, when a person just mumbles and uh, they get so nervous that they don't know what to say and not saying in an interview, you are going to be nervous, but if you prepare and you practice, practice is one of the, one of the biggest things as well to uh, prepare and practice what you're going to say. And so when you can kind of prepare yourself and practice what you're going to say, that's going to take the nervousness away from you. Yeah, it's going to be stressful. And yeah, you're going to be nervous when you go in there. But then when you're able to answer their question, listen to what they're asking you, and then be able to answer their question, what that's going to do is it's going to take the nervousness away. And the more you are able to answer their question, the more confident you're going to become because they're going to see you as being confident in what you're talking about. And a lot of times confidence comes in the way you come into the interview, the way you shake a person's hands, the way you look at a person eye to eye, that conveys confidence. And then when you're able to answer their question and answer it, in an intelligent, in an educated way, that's going to help you as well. But the worst thing you can do is go into an interview and not be prepared, because if you're not prepared, that's just going to, you know, that's just going to hurt your chances. And when I worked at uh, Workforce Solutions, when I was helping people uh, find jobs, we did a lot of role playing. We did a lot of video and we would uh, go, uh, go back and repeat critique what, what the person did well, and then what they needed to work on. And the more you do that, the more confident a person will be. And yeah, they'll be nervous when they go in and, and they'll be, you know, kind of stressed. But once they have practice and they plan what they're going to do, then that takes away a lot of the nervousness. And that's what you want to be. I mean, it's good to be nervous, but you don't want to be so nervous you can't answer their question. So you want to be, you know, first of all, plan, uh, like Wynn said, and practice, practice, practice. And the more you do that, the more confident you'll be. Thank you so much. And um, Anel, do you want to take us home? Yeah, I have so many stories, y'all. Um, I've worked in <laughs> various industries. The worst, um, so we're in a time of hybrid models or work from home or remote work. So it's not just in-person interviews anymore. There are phone interviews, there's video interviews. Those have been around, but they're even more prevalent today. And I would say, pay attention to your background noises or what's in your background, because that can impact you greatly. Uh, I had a candidate that was answering a phone interview from the car before. And I'm like, ma'am, are you driving? Like, please, no, we're not doing this. I, you need to be safe. And so like, that would be like <laughs> worst case scenario right there where like, I can hear the cars when you're on the highway. Like it sounds different than if you're sitting at home in a quiet environment. Uh, so be aware of your background surroundings because we hear everything. And whether if it's video, whether it's phone, we literally hear everything. <laughs> 
Um, in person, I've had some experiences. Usually the, the interviews that go the best go over time. I've noticed like if I'm really jamming with a candidate, I'll ask follow-up questions, especially if they say something that interests me and I can go back to that and we can go more in depth. The more in depth and the more you have their interest engaged, those are always the best interviews. I had a situation once where I had two candidates that were an ideal fit for the role, right? They, um, they were um, interns from Korea. They were coming to study abroad here and part of it was an internship. And one candidate had all of the qualifications we needed, but wasn't really a great culture fit. The other was a perfect culture fit, but didn't have all the qualifications. And we ended up going with, in this situation, the one that was more of a culture fit because the qualifications she was missing were easily trainable. And sure enough, like the other one, after talking with her, I'm like, you're going to be better in a more corporate role, like not nonprofit world. Like you need more structure. You need, like you could tell their personality type and they're both excellent candidates and they both added me on LinkedIn and are, we're still connected. And it's just knowing that fit, like having that well-roundedness, having that experience, asking those follow-up questions, having, it's a conversation. An interview is 100% a hundred percent of conversation. When I'm interviewing you, I'm not just asking a question and then moving to the next one. I will listen to what you're saying and then go into what you just, what your answer was, because you're like, okay, well, you decided there, like, there's a reason why you say the answer you do. And it's kind of like picking your brain, seeing how you work, seeing how you function. My HR style adds a lot of psychology to it. Um, a lot of dialectal behavior therapy I've integrated into my HR style because you're, we're people, we're human. How do people work? And so knowing like, okay, this person used this word specifically, like, let's go more in deep in that. Like why, like how their brain goes that path versus this path. Cause certain words can tell you how they function, how they act. And from there, it's, it's just, it keeps going, like have that conversation, treat it like a conversation. And that helps relieve the nerves. Um, it helps you get to know the candidate as well. Like one of the best questions you can ask someone is how did you get into the, your role? Like, how did you get here? You know, you could ask about the person that was in the role prior. Like what were the characteristics you like? Like what was their success factors? Like getting to have that flow. And it also alleviates the tension for the interviewers because us interviewers are just as nervous, man. Like I do this for a living and I get nervous when I'm interviewing candidates as well because you need to be careful with what you're saying and what you're answering because you don't want to guide the candidate because there are certain words you can say and the candidate will mimic that answer. And you're like, well, I wanna, I wanna hear you say that. I don't want you saying it because I said it. And so it's very like mm -hmm. strategic sure. path of how you interview. So we always have to be careful with not giving away stuff so that you guys give us those answers that we want. Um, but yeah, a lot of the strong candidates were ones that knew the company, had you know great charisma, were memorable you know, came, like, showed they were ready to work then and there, had questions, wanted more eagerness, you know, um, ambition are all uh, strong traits. Some of the, like, the lackluster candidates were ones that were not prepared. They just didn't have follow-up questions. They were really, the shortest interview I've done has been, like, 10 minutes. Like, yeah, there, it's it's a crazy world out there. Like, you can quit tell, quickly tell if someone's not a good fit, and mm -hmm. it's not it's it's and you don't you time it's you know as a recruiter or as an you know onboarding for hr your time is precious because that could be another candidate you're talking to that could be a time you're mm -hmm. working on a different thing and so if you know a candidate's not a good fit right away you may skip around with questions and just to get the answers you need to know but it's also like win said like some candidates may not interview as well but you can usually there's some things you can look at for and that's kind of where the psychology comes into with mannerism, body language, and how they answer. Even if they're super nervous and don't answer well, if their answer matches what you're looking for and they're using the right language and you can tell they know what they're talking about, you can figure out if they're going to be a good worker. Usually that happens more in the tech world. There's a lot of awkwardness <laughs> when you're interviewing technical candidates, but a lot, they know their stuff. And that's kind of the key. And that's why those interviews are structured differently. So you can see what they know. Um, and yeah, like I, I have stories, y'all, but it's uh, it's, <laughs> yeah. I know Richard's laughing because he knows it's true. Like you get to meet all types of people <laughs> when you're interviewing or recruiting. Yep. 
I know. Thank you so much. I loved that you talked about when you were really jamming with someone. Um, I think my, the job I'm currently in the interview lasted an hour on the phone and it was just a really jammy conversation. So thank you to all of y'all. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Single. Well, thank you, Jennifer. And thank you so much, Anel, Wynn, and Richard. Uh, Anel just mentioned in her answer to the last question, the importance of having a conversation when you're interviewing. And what I just love about this um, time that we've been together tonight is that you all had a conversation with each other. Um, you know, sometimes at these events, panelists answer their question and then aren't paying attention to what the other people are saying. But I think it's a real testament to what you said earlier about the value of the St. Edwards education and being a good communicator and a good listener, that this was, this was um, just a really um, good experience. And I think you shared a lot of great information for our students. Um, I also wanna thank the moderators uh, for doing a fantastic job. And um, if there are no final comments from everyone, I would wish everyone a good evening and thank you again. Thank you so much. Really appreciate our time together and I hope everyone has a good homecoming week. Looking forward to homecoming. Great. Thank you all for having us. See you later. Thank you. It was nice to meet you all. Take care. Thank you. Have a good evening. And don't forget to connect. Like, to be, don't feel nervous. Like, add people on LinkedIn. Reach out. Like, we're, you know, alumni. Oh, love yeah, that's a good out. point. Like, that's you know, a good point in there. Yeah. look us up, find us. We, uh, you know, we all have connections and we always want to give back. Right. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you.